Welcome to the Business Spotlight Series. My name is Kay Cote and I'm your podcast host here at Action Coach in Central Texas. Today we have Jesse Wang, CEO and founder of Twirlista. Today we're going to be diving into her business, her business journey to ownership, challenges and best practices that she's learned along the way. If this is your first time on our channel, be sure to like and subscribe to get notifications when we drop new conversations just like this one. Well, Jesse, thanks so much for being on the show today. Welcome. I'd love to hear a little bit about you, your background, and tell us a bit about your business too. Thank you, Kay. It's an honor. Uh, my name is Jesse Wan, and I'm the founder and CEO of Tolista. Tolista is a platform that provides um, e-commerce service specifically Gen Z consumers. And uh, what sets us apart is that we provide rental services, rental um, consumers can rent apparel on our website and they can actually split the bill, so to speak. So it's a group rental service, which I can elaborate a bit, you know, um, uh, elaborate a little bit later. And my background, um, I actually come from an academic background. I was a marketing professor for seven years before I started this business. And um, the funny thing is that I sort of quit my professor job right after I got tenure. Uh, literally the first day of tenure, I quit my job and uh, I continued my entrepreneurship journey and then never looked back. So yeah, I'll stop here and I, um, yeah, let you kind of take it from here. Wow. That's a really cool story. I love that. You know, you kind of like follow that passion and dream and built, you know, this company. Uh, so you're the sole founder. Are there any other outside investors or like, what does your business structure look like? Yeah, I am a solo founder. We do, uh, we are a VC backed company. So we do have, uh, Enjoy investors, including a fund investor. Um, I was fortunate that in the very beginning of business, I, got to know some Android investors and they have been mentors as well this whole time. And it's been just tremendously helpful. Um, yeah, we are post-revenue company and uh, it is amazing that, you know, I feel like our customers love what we have to offer and they're very loyal. And yeah, it's been just an amazing journey thus far. That sounds really cool. I'm excited to dive into your business too. Um, and I, But first, like, I'd love to hear about what does your role look like in your day-to-day? -day? I know as an entrepreneur, each day may look different, but I'd love to get an idea of like how many hours you spend working like in your business, like the job of what you do, and then how many on the business, like the strategy, planning, and things like that. Yeah, I think that one thing as a founder uh, is you are never off the clock. <laughs> I feel like I'm basically always on the clock. I'm pretty much always plugged in. We use Slack as the internal communication and then with the external uh, brands and customers, we normally use email. So I think I'm constantly on my Slack and on my email, try to be there if there's an urgent need. Um, it's very hard to say hours because I feel like I'm always on, on the job, but I do have a personal life as well. So I try to strike a balance to avoid burning out. <laughs> um, I hope that answers the question. It's not as bad as um, it sounds though, because I truly enjoy what I do. So mm -hmm. I think some people maybe wait for the weekend um, when, you know, from when they're working during the weekday, they wait for the weekend. I should find myself sometimes, sometimes, sometimes wait for Monday because there's like a list of things I can't wait to kind of get on and start working on. So that's a good thing. At least I love what I do. That is so true. You know, if you wake up excited to do what you do, it's like in a way you don't work a day in your life. In a way you're like always working, but if it's what you love, then it doesn't feel like a grind of a work. It feels more like you're, you're enjoying it. So that's a, that's actually really cool. I like to hear that. Um, so I'd like to move on to, you know, let's deep dive into your business. What makes it special? You know, who, who do you, like you, you kind of briefly touched on who you serve, but I'd love if you could elaborate on your business. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. So what makes us special? I think a couple of things, but the primary thing is actually affordability of using our business like product and service. 
Um, when I was a professor and my students who are college students, they uh, constantly talk to me or complain to me about how expensive it is to purchase event wear. Um, as a college student, especially if you belong to a club or a sorority, um, you actually had uh, college students had a lot of opportunities to go to uh, date parties and galas and just uh, opportunities to wear formal event dresses. And mm. those dresses are a lot of times quite unique and stand out. And it's a memorable kind of thing. Once you wear it once and we all like posting on Instagram and TikTok and, you know, social media nowadays, it's actually quite unlikely they're going to wear it again. So that can add up very quickly, given students are already on tight budget. Mm -hmm. So I thought to myself, you know, they're right. They don't really have a choice to do this, like to look good and also be, you know, uh, stay within the budget at the same time. So I decided, hey, why don't I create this giant closet for students across the country to share so that they can pay uh, a small amount of fees, wear this once and give it back and someone else can wear it again. So it, it took so many iterations until today. One of the features our platform has is essentially split the bill. So uh, someone who say, um, you know, lives in a sorority or belong to a student organization, they can, like one person can create a order, which is a group order. And that person can share the link with group members. Um, it could be as few as two people. It's a group or can be as many as a thousand. There's no upper limit. And then mm -hmm. each person from that group can order and each person can pay a fee that's only 17 to $20. And then the whole order will be grouped into one order that is going to be shipped at the same time to the person who order um, uh, create a group in the first place. And then um, consumers actually have opportunities to also request that to be shipped to individual addresses, separate addresses, if they mm -hmm. prefer not to ship to, be shipped to one address. Um, so that's like a lot of flexibility there. So the advantage is we are able to offer an extremely low price um, because of the economy of scale. So that sets apart us from um, most rental services out there, they are mostly subscription based and the cost is about like around hundred dollars a month. And then you just have to pay month after month. For us, there's no subscription model. Uh, when you need it, you can pay 17 to $20 and you rent the dress. You do not have to worry about, you know, washing it. Uh, we take care of, um, you know, all that kind of stuff and small damages. So yeah, we really do create a lot of value for consumers who want to be a part of this rental culture, but at the same time cannot afford the services that's out there or the services that's out there are actually inconvenient for them. And, you know, it's a, it's a longer story to kind of talk about why our services in a way is a lot more convenient to use. That is really cool. Like, I really like learning about this because it's like, I think of the things like I could have used, you know, or I can still even to this day in my, even in my adult life to use, yeah. you know, for different galas and functions and things and go in with a group or, you know, the people I work with. And so this is really, really cool. I'm very curious. So how does storing these dresses look like? Or do you have a warehouse or like you said, the closet? So I'm really kind of curious to what that looks like. Yeah, we do. We have a fairly big closet, fairly big warehouse, actually in Midwest. That's where I started my business. I was a professor uh, in Ohio, and that's where I started. So warehouse is still there. I'm now based in Austin, but um, we do have a team that um, they ship out inventory and everything is being shipped back to the Ohio warehouse. Um it, it looks like a giant closet. I Every time I visit the warehouse, it's such a treat for me. I It's just like every girl's dream to see rows and rows of beautiful dresses hanging. So That is incredible too. So where do you source your dresses from? Do you Are you constantly replenishing with like the latest styles or what does that look like for you? Yeah, this is a really good question. So we right now use a wholesale buy model. We are in the process of collaborating with some brands that um, younger consumers love. And we hope to have partnership with those brands and purchase perhaps from them. And um, sorry, remind me the second question. You said the... It was... Um... 
the, oh yeah. Like, are you replenishing with like fresh styles or how does that work? That's right. So one thing that we actually do slightly different from maybe other rental company or retailers is that we have a very close relationship with our um, consumers or so customer group. They would give us indication um, before, like a month or two months before they need a dress. They will let us know actually, hey, in two months we have this gala or party that the theme is this, the color is this, the length is this. So we have that advantage. So when we do source, we have that in mind. And then we even use a cloud sourcing strategy. Like we have a fairly, um, you know, decent size following our uh, Instagram. And then we would send pictures out to our Instagram stories and be like, hey, like we are thinking about selecting these style dresses. What, what do you all think? And then our customers will vote. And then we will a lot of times take the, you know, purchase the dresses that fits a certain criteria. So it needs to get a certain number of yeses, you know, um, that sort of thing. And that's really effective to find dresses that, you know, that customers will like. Also, I think involving customers in, like a sourcing, make them feel like they are more connected with the business, right? They are part of the business. Um, so yeah, we definitely want to continue this type of relationship with the customers. Oh, that's really cool. So I really like that community kind of engagement that you're creating for, for your customers. And so that kind of leads me into marketing. Like I have a couple of questions about marketing, which is obviously something you're highly focused on. So what has like been your best like platform of, of choice and how have you tapped into that platform to get the most benefit? Yeah, it's actually kind of interesting, uh, given that, you know, uh, clothing rental e-commerce really traditionally needs a lot of marketing, right? Otherwise, how would people know what you are selling? But because our motto is very specific, we um, kind of like uh, broadcast our product offering through a group member, um, because as I mentioned, we have this split the bill function that the group member create a link um, or a place in group order, then the team, the group members will like order through a collection essentially. So we haven't really done a traditional uh, inbound marketing. We have done outbound kind of like sales calls, so to speak. Like we would reach out to people who we think will be good team members or group member, group leaders, excuse me, group leaders. And then we explain to them, hey, this is what we do, you know, give us a shot. And um, in the beginning, honestly, it's quite difficult because um, when we reach out to group of leaders, they were very confused. <laughs> There's no the such thing existed in the marketplace. They were like, okay, that sounds interesting, but like, I've never heard of anything like this, right? But now we do have a reputation, a good one among students. So it became one like, a lot easier like a lot of them when i talk to them they will be like oh yeah we have heard of you guys like either from a friend or from social media and that's really um it's really awesome there's some sort of brand awareness that's you know forming quite organically because we still haven't done um our bar marketing uh that is something um you know we are looking into though Oh, that sounds really great. That word of mouth, especially um, young students, that's like huge. When they find something they like, they're really going to latch on. So I think that's incredible strategy. Um, are you working now with any, like with, with your, like even say your vendors and the people you work with, do you work with a CRM to organize that? Or how do you communicate with your, um, like the people you work with? Yeah, we mostly just use Slack. Um, so the group leaders, they are mostly just on our Slack. We do have a proprietary, uh, proprietary platform built um, to organize a group order and things like that. Um, I know a lot of e-commerce are off the shelf on Shopify, which is amazing. I love Shopify as a tool, but um, because our business model is quite different, um, we actually cannot use the Shopify platform. Um, but I, I do think that if I have a, you know, advice for, uh, new business owners who are thinking about launching an e-commerce Shopify is amazing. Mm -hmm. There's really no need to create something from a scratch. Very true. I've used Shopify in the past for businesses and it's just so seamless. I love how it organizes things and yeah, I could go on about that too. Yeah. Um, so it's been fun learning about your business. I'd learn, I'd love to learn like a little bit about your why, like 
what made you choose to go into business for yourself and as opposed for working, you know, for somebody else? Like, and then what was that transition like for you? Yeah, thank you so much for asking that question. Um, I think for me, it everything just happened very, very quickly. I have talked to some founders um, after I got into this area. They it seems like they are serial entrepreneurs, right? Maybe after they graduate from college, they never thought about working for someone else. They in college, they always knew. I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I wanted to start a company. And I think that's amazing. At this young age, they know exactly what they want. And for me, it was not at all like that. I was very much lost when I graduated from college. I did not know what I wanted. I had like five different jobs within two and a half years. I kept on changing jobs because I wasn't happy with any job I found. And then I went back to grad school. I did my PhD in consumer behavior. After that, the path was very much set because if you graduate from a decent PhD program that you're expected to find a professor or faculty job at a university and you expect to publish papers and teach and all that. So I did all, all that because, you know, that was um, basically the path, right? You don't spend five, six years to do a PhD not to do that. So for me, it was very natural. I thought, okay, well, I was just be a professor for the rest of my life which I loved my being a professor. It was, it was so fun teaching students. It was so fun to do research. Um, but this opportunity sort of happened during pandemic. I think that um, sometimes, you know, you just have to go with it. <laughs> like opportunity knock on the door, you just have to go with it. Yeah, so in my case, I met this mentor and also angel investor online. And then we just hit it off over the phone. At that time, everybody was isolating and um, it was like, in the height of the pandemic so there was no visiting in person everybody's just at home but we spoke on the phone multiple times and she encouraged me to start business and I felt like you know what this this is probably a once in a lifetime opportunity so and then I always knew the pain point of students uh telling me like the getting buying dresses is not just expensive also mm -hmm. sustainability is a big thing right so, yeah. um Nowadays, young um, Gen Z consumers, they're very environmentally conscious, and that's that's really good to see. And then they are interested in secondhand shopping. They are interested in renting, much more interesting than the last generation. So I know this is like where the trend is going. I think um, how we consume fashion, say, 10 years, 15 years from now, will be very different from what we are doing today. We are already seeing the change that a lot more people are interested in uh, thrifting, a lot more people are interested in consignment shopping, a lot more people are interested in renting. Like, um, I think previous generation, whenever you think about clothing, the only answer is, oh, I'm going to go buy the clothing, right? There's never, oh, I'm going to rent it or I'm going to, you know, thrift it. There's no such thing. But now, you know, that purchasing is not just the only answer anymore. So, yeah, I sort of like I had an opportunity, met a mentor. I also um, had on my mind this problem that needs to be solved, which is that, you know, the buying the kitchen dresses, um, month after month it can be very very expensive so i just thought let's just do it let's just see what happens and yeah so here's where we are today that is incredible that that's such a cool journey and you know sometimes it's just like when you've hit that entrepreneurship when it just finds you it's like all of a sudden you're like whoa i'm on this path and yep yep <laughs> that's exactly what happened all of a sudden i'm like what <laughs> you're like i gotta get on this wave <laughs> yeah yeah that much. is that is a really cool story. So I'd love to share, you know, it kind of to inspire our audience. What is a a memorable roadblock or hurdle that you had to go through or that you went through within the business that you overcame, and how did you do that? I think that if you ask like um, a hundred startup founder, they would tell you every day there's a roadblock. <laughs> I think startup is just a journey where it's not for faint hearted. Um, I remember the first version of Tolista, it was very different from what it is today. So at that time I was like, hey, like there are a lot of rental companies. So all I want to do is like, um, I'm just going to create another rental company that's like very similar to what's existed out there. And um, I remember I sourced a whole bunch of dresses. At that time, my idea was like, let's rent out dresses that are already in the, you know, 
like it's it's not brand new so it's already in the um kind of Uh, circle of life right like it's it's already out there existing so that we have the least environmental impact so we created this whole website on shopify and um you know had the hundreds of products on there and uh worked months on it and then i thought okay well as soon as i click launch the orders should have fly in obviously i know there's a demand <laughs> But it was like a zero order. It's literally crickets. And after months of work, and I was like, uh, what is happening? Why nobody find this attractive? And I think at that time, and then later I realized, oh, like not only we didn't do much marketing, also the products were, uh, you know, outdated. They were not trendy, like on trend enough. And there were just so many problems that I didn't understand as like a first time founder Uh, first iteration of the of the products so that was a humbling experience to know like hard work does not equal to success <laughs> oh that is well you know what's so powerful is like that you were able to take that and kind of pivot and then create like something new and now what it is today so thank you thank for you. sharing that story that's so inspiring um you know when you think about kind of the next like the future of your business what do you where do you want to be in the next three to five years Great question. So uh, I'm very confident about like the trend that's moving forward for event wear, especially younger consumers. I think that's actually not just limited to younger consumers. Uh, just like you and me are also thinking about, hey, I don't want to buy a whole bunch of dresses. I don't want to every single wedding I go to, I spend two, three hundred dollars to buy a dress as a guest. And the next wedding I go to, I have to repeat it, repeat that again. And I have all these dress uh, dresses like hanging in my closet and I don't know what to do with them. Mm -hmm. And um, I think the trend for event, event wares is going to be more like a rental or resale. I don't think we're going back to everybody purchase their address where it once put in the closet. I think people are becoming more and more environmentally conscious and also budget conscious, honestly. I feel like the younger generation consumers, they're... Um, in a way more financially savvy, they are, you know, they have a lot more information, they know how to save money. And then they are looking at, um, you know, their statement and thinking, hey, like, what can I do to make sure I'm not spending uh, $200 on this dress, I can use that $200 to maybe travel because like younger generation are very much into experiences, right? They want to travel to different destinations to experience the world, which is amazing. Um, mm. So yeah, so I think we will um, focus on serving young young consumers in the event wear uh, kind of like um, category. I still think that uh, we want to be very focused and then we also want to be um, basically the leader in the space of group rental. Um, we do provide a lot of value for large groups um, such as sorority students that they have the same gala to go to. And for our business model, For larger groups, we also provide uh, pop-up shop in their living room so they can actually receive the dress before they purchase it and they can try it on, like have a try-on party in their living room. And that's so fun. It's always a treat for students. So yeah, I, I think the, the market is still very big for us to kind of expand into. And then we found like early success among our current customer base. And we'll just learn from, you know, our mistakes and just continue to uh, keep going. Oh, I dig that. It reminds me back when I was a student, getting ready is half the fun. So to kind of create an experience around choosing the dresses and trying them on that, I really love. It makes me, yeah. makes me want to be a student again. <laughs> yeah, it's a very social experience for sure. Oh, that is great. Well, this has been such a fun, like I, we pulled so many great nuggets out of this conversation. And as we're kind of beginning to wrap up, I have a few rapid fire questions for you. These are those quick top of mind answers. I've got four of them for you. Uh, the first one is what is your key to success? Don't ever be afraid of failure. I think that, you know, when you start this journey, you just have to uh, decide I'm going to fail. Perhaps you're going to fail every day. But uh, to be very quick in learning, uh, to be very quick to learn from your mistakes. Obviously, when you fail, uh, it's always a learning opportunity. Uh, don't let a crisis go to waste. 
And um, yeah, and it just keep on going. Be very, very resilient. <laughs> no matter how many people tell you this is not going to work, you need to have uh, a strong faith in yourself and in what you are creating has value and just don't keep, keep on going. Mm, that's great advice. And that leads me to my next question. What is one piece of advice you would have for other business owners? Oh yeah, that's actually a really good question. I wish I had uh, learned this in the early days of my journey, but it's now it's too, not too late. There are so many amazing tools off shelf that you don't need to build. Like you just have to be scrappy. In the very beginning of uh, starting a business, funding is always, you know, a problem <laughs> and very mm -hmm. few people start business with millions and millions of dollars right like we all a lot of times people have to bootstrap so be very resourceful and creative um kind of like um, spend the least amount of money to uh find the most traction like use minimum amount of resources to find the most success because that mm -hmm. is going to um you know first give yourself confidence and also uh if what you're thinking doesn't work. You haven't lost so much that you have no resources left, nothing left to pivot your idea and go to the next thing. So just be very scrappy. Mm, that's so true too. Uh, so next question is, what is one book or piece of content that you're reading now or have read recently that's impacted you? Yeah, um, it's funny, actually. Um, I, on the way to work today i was listening to um how to build it build it is i think is that's the podcast mm -hmm. and uh, one of the founders his name is larry liu he's actually a personal friend of mine and he's a founder of a um online grocer for minority consumers in united states it's called we and he was interviewed by um i think it's gary or something i can't remember his name the yeah he was a, a fantastic podcast and it went through basically he's experienced a founder uh right from like a selling things on ebay uh to um fail at his first business um and then pivot like a you know it was a very deep dive into his experiences and um i've heard him speak at a different uh, functions before but this is probably the first time i heard the full story at a, like a one hour podcast and you know i i just mentioned the resiliency of founders honestly like it's a given someone who is not resilient is probably not a good idea to be a founder <laughs> It's okay. just there's so many challenges and um, you just have to keep on going at it. And then doesn't matter what happens, you have to be the last one standing. Even if everybody around you said this is not going to work, you have to find a way to make this work. So oh. that's, that piece of content was definitely very inspiring. Definitely. Oh, so that's um, my final question is, if you had to choose only one area of your business, you could immediately improve tomorrow. What would it be? Marketing, actually, <laughs> we kind of <laughs> went a <full> circle. <laughs> um, in a couple of months, like a shameless plug here, we are going to have a new version of the website come live. And um, that for well, that version is going to be open to public. I've had a lot of people asking me, oh, I want to rent from your business. How can I do that? So right now, actually, any consumer, uh, they cannot. They have to belong to a group. And there's a process to onboard a group leader and all that. But in two months, um, anybody can go on our website. So, okay, you can go on our website and start an order. You do not need to have a group because as long as you like have a 65 minimum um, kind of purchase or order of uh, rental, that's it. Or you can split that 65 with a friend of yours. So each you will pay like $32. So I need to make this, um, like I need to let consumers know this is a, uh, super affordable, sustainable kind of option for them uh, for event dress rentals. So yeah, I'm in the process of working on that. Well, very cool. Well, that leads me right into my next question, which is all about marketing. How can people find you? Feel free to share your website handles any way people can uh, get in touch. 
Yeah, so you can see my brand name. That's is it this way? <laughs> I yeah, it's a, yeah. This way, right yeah. So twelista.com is our main website right now. And you can kind of visit that and then you will see the type of dresses we have to offer. And you can also follow us on Instagram at uh, twelista.us. And that's our Instagram handle. And then we have uh, giveaways and things like that up there. So if you're interested, you can definitely find us. And if you need... um you know, more information, you can always email info at tolista.com. So yeah. And then, you know, I'm always interested in connecting. Find me on LinkedIn. I'm uh, active on LinkedIn. Yeah. It's very, um, always open to talk to interesting people for sure. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Well, that brings us to our final question for today. What is most inspiring to you today? Today? Um, I'm going to go back to the podcast because like that literally happened. I think that I always thought, uh, oh, wow, I'm such a hard worker. You know, I am very resilient. But honestly, compared to some of the hurdles other founders have faced, not just Larry, I'm sure many other founders, every single startup founder probably has tons of story to tell us like the hardship they've gone through and then how resilient they were when they faced challenges. So I think that um, is very inspiring to kind of let, to, to know that I'm not alone. I'm not the only person who's facing lots of challenges. Everyone is, we are in this together and yeah, and they didn't give up. Why should I? <laughs> I, yes. I definitely shouldn't either. So that's really powerful. Well, thank you so much, Jesse. This has been an incredible conversation. I've loved talking to you, learning about you, your business. So thank you so much for being a guest on the show. Of course, Kate. It's a pleasure.